hand over to Killian. So thank you very much. Okay, that's great. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, so as Rob mentioned, my name is Killian Murphy, the less famous, but none less um, famous in DCU one. Um, I work in DCU in our Student Support and Development Unit, and I'm here today to talk about Discover DCU, which is our online transition and study skills program for all incoming first years coming through to the university. What I'm going to cover today is firstly, I want to give you guys a background to the Discover project, why it is that we came up with this and why it is that we think it's important and why it might be relevant to, to some of you now in, in this space at this moment in time, trying to figure out how to do maybe some aspect of online orientation in um, September due to COVID. Um, then I'm going to look at a project timeline, how long it took us to put together what we now have as a package, um, which may be, again, useful in, in terms of anybody considering doing something similar. I want to then put the focus towards H5P in particular, which is the, the software that we use to build Discover DCU and its housing within Moodle and how that all works. And then finally look towards student usage and the feedback that we receive from students to date on the initiative. Uh, I'm looking forward to hear, getting some uh, thoughts and comments from you guys at the end of the presentation. No doubt if you have um, kind of thoughts as we go, pop them into the chat bar and I'll let Rob kind of maybe collate that and, and pop questions to me at the end. So to kick off, um, the background. So what is Discover DCU? Very simply, it's a series of short interactive courses designed to help students settle in and introduce them to the tools and skills needed to succeed at university. So basically it's an online transition and study skills course for students coming into DCU. So it's combining those two functions, both the transition function, but also then a lasting study skills resource. So we get a lot of use from first year students in particular, that's who it's, it's pitched at, but actually we get a lot of continuing students also using the resource, second, third, fourth under, year undergrads, and actually uh, quite a lot of uh, master students also, and quite popular with our, our international cohort. Um, it's a cross-university collaboration. I think this is one of the unique things about Discover DCU. It's not just something that we work on in, in student support. We also have to, by necessity, work on it with um, Rob's team and the Teaching Enhancement Unit for their uh, online expertise. Uh, we've worked a lot with our open education unit. So DCU has a, a long tradition in providing distance degrees. So we worked with our open education unit um, with that, who have that experience to try to put together this package. We work consistently with the, the library on it, uh, ISS, Registry, DCU Healthy, DCU Sustainable. If you can think of any DCU something, it's probably involved in some way in this particular project. So that's um, the team that kind of is behind this. Why did we decide then to come up with um, a Discover DCU uh, course? Why was it necessary? And I'd kind of, I was thinking about this when I was prepping the slides and I, feel there's three key reasons why we decided to develop this um, online transition and study skills course. The first is incorporation. So DCU um, was involved in a major incorporation process a couple of years ago, as many people would be aware, where we went from um, a relatively kind of contained small university of about 10,000 students up to about 17, 18,000 now, where we incorporated um, three teaching training colleges. So we now went from one campus location with relatively kind of manageable number of students to a much larger student body spread across three primary campuses. So just by necessity, we had to think differently about how we were doing the whole orientation process. And that was a catalyst in getting this project going. The second was the, the obvious move towards online learning that's been happening in the sector, even pre-COVID and trying to, to use those type of resources to do things like orientation just better and to get students also engaged in our online learning platform as soon as possible to orientate them into that space. And then the final, probably the biggest, but the very simplest reason was we were, um, it was a very simple choice for us, buy it or build it. So previous to developing this particular series of courses, DCU would have invested in bought in packages uh, by the likes of Skills for Study Campus or, or Epigeum where you were paying maybe a license fee, eight, 10,000 euro a year. Um, and then you would get a kind of generic content for kind of study skills for university purposes. And there's various other ones out there in the field, but this is expensive. Um, and um, like it or not, we're um, moved, pushed towards, let's say, developing our own. But actually I think that turned out to be a, a bit of a, a blessing in disguise. So um, we decided to build our own package. 
And we kind of think that there's a couple of unique benefits to having our own bespoke DCU transition um, and study skills package. The first is, and foremost, is that students have access to this course at their offer stage. So as soon as they receive an offer letter from DCU, no matter whether that's a mature student on round A or round zero or whatever, or an uh, incoming regular secondary student who gets their offer in, in August, or an international student who receives an offer otherwise, they get access to this course as soon as they get that offer letter with their login details to Moodle. So they don't even have to um, be on campus to begin the orientation process. Therefore, orientation actually begins several weeks before term starts, before the student is physically on the campus itself. Um, and we think that is, is a key, uh, unique selling point to this program. The material is obviously online 24 seven, it's interactive, it's accessible, it's got a student focus, a student content. Um, and it's tailored to DCU students. So again, I, sp I spoke previously about kind of bought in packages. A lot of them would have be very UK centric where, you know, well, in this case, we've got um, Irish students, DCU students specifically, um, giving video advice to incoming DCU students on how they manage different aspects of the first year journey. So it really begins to feel like you're coming to college, hopefully, before you're ever actually physically there. Um, we then think that it encourages the use of technology early. So we want students on our BLE, on Moodle, as quickly as possible in getting used to it. And this is part of the transition to that. And then the fact that it's housed in Moodle means that we can monitor the usage, we can record it, we can review, we can look at it across faculties, across cohorts in any way that we wish. And then finally, we can also feed it into our, um, what we call our DCU Engagement Award, which is a kind of a recognition award for students who are engaged in different aspects of, of student life. At DCU, and we have a for the first year component of that award, you must complete the um, eight courses in Discover DCU. So it all connects up neatly across the, the kind of ecosystem that we're trying to build. So, in terms of the timeline, um, basically it takes took us quite a lot of time to develop something like this. The initial eight courses were developed um, in 2017, was when we the first idea. We did a lot of heavy storyboarding out for what will go into each course, and then every year since we've essentially totally revise the courses based on student feedback and we have a constant feedback loop set up within each course and then we, we keep building on that and then we've tried to work as we go year by year to improve things like we now promote the courses much more proactively to students from that offer letter stage onwards um, and it's taken a couple of years to I suppose embed it into the environment here at DCU and to kind of have faculty buy-in and whatnot um, but it's culminated finally in, uh, we won this year, the DCU President's Award for Innovation for the, for the project. I say we should have won it two to three years ago, but nonetheless, we got there eventually. So uh, we're delighted with that. And then we're looking towards uh, the academic year 2021. And I suppose we already now have a location where we can build in more information around orientation, which is, is naturally going to be happening online and for lots of us this year. But every single year, revision of courses it takes time it takes effort it takes a project team but um, it keeps the project moving at the same time so i'm just going to put the focus now a little bit towards um why h5p and moodle why these are the tools that we engage with in order to build this online course and i will show you guys at the end of the presentation what it actually looks like um, um on, on in moodle itself but basically there's we looked at what we were going to use for this um we were interested in, in using a free and open technology. We didn't want to be paying for anything, basically. And that was the whole point of moving away from a subscription service. So we chose H5P for this purpose. Um, it's mobile friendly. It's got plugins for Moodle, Drupal, et cetera, all the various systems that we were already using in the organization. And um, it has a number of kind of content types that can be utilized. One of these is the presentation mode, and that's the, the, um, the content type that we decided to use for the artifacts that we were building within this course. And then naturally, um, why we chose Moodle is because that's what we already had, um, but it syncs up with H5P, it facilitates usage of you know, data usage and tracking and stats. It also means that we're getting students into the VLE, into Moodle, ASAP at the very start of their transition process, and it meant that we didn't require students to go anywhere else to access these courses. As you can see from the screen grab there on, on the screen, we auto enroll all first year students in this course. So they just pop onto Moodle and it's already there. They don't have to be sent off to any other location. It keeps it very simple and seamless. 
in terms of the design, this is what we had kind of been working on for our Moodle page for the, the year gone past. That will be updated this year. We have a, a, a new update coming in Moodle, which we're really looking forward to. But we kind of try to make it as simple as possible for students. This is what the course are about, a welcome from the university itself. And this is how to use the series of courses that we developed. We then divided it up into um, two stages. So there's eight courses that we use, but we try to give the students the information as they need it without overwhelming them. So for that purpose, we divide it into stage one, which is pre-orientation. So that's really our orientation type courses. And the students have access to that straight away um, from their offer letter. And then we only make the stage two, the kind of learning study skills courses available then when semester begins. So it gives us a key structure. So there's our eight courses. The first three with orientation focus are available at the start of the, uh, at the from before the student comes on campus. And then when semester begins, we, we make other courses available so as to not overwhelm them with information that they don't necessarily need or understand yet. But of course, we have control over what we want to do there and we review that each year and think about how we might change things depending on student feedback. And then, as I mentioned, it, it, um, it feeds into our engagement award. When students complete all eight courses, automatically a certificate pops up at the bottom of the page and then they can just uh, add that to their um, e-portfolio that we call loop reflect here at dcu so it's just it's seamless across our systems and it, it also means there's minimal admin for us in, in students board having to go back and check workshop attendances and all that type of thing it just goes seamlessly across um, the h5p design itself as you can see here on screen this is kind of what we've developed with our commons and marketing team. So again, the advantages here is that it, it's, it's, it's all within the DCU branding. So it begins to feel like the DCU campus and environments straight away um, from this course onwards. Um, as you can see, using the, the presentation mode, we are provided with a navigation pane on the left-hand side. So students can just click to whatever part of a course that they're interested in working through. They don't have to work through the whole thing if they don't wish to. It enables us then to um, embed uh, videos, graphics, images, etc. And we developed um, a couple of dozen videos at this point, um, very short kind of one, two minute clips that we pop up on YouTube with current DCU students explaining how they did different things or how they made friends starting off or how they managed their first assignment. So it's got that strong student voice. Um, we have an activity after every section that enables a kind of interactive element and also enables data tracking. And then finally, we, we gather feedback on every single course. We have a feedback link and loop set up. And what we particularly like about this whole, you know, the, the use of H5P is that we can embed our own videos into it. And we try to have a really strong student first voice and at that, a diverse student voice. So we try to find representatives of our, our different student cohorts and make sure their voice is represented within the courses. So it's DCU students telling incoming DCU students how to manage life at university. And finally, it also gives us an ability to start actually working through a staff voice. So we have, for example, tips from different lecturers on how to do your first presentation, how to manage group work, and how to become a critical thinker and, and various other things like that. So, and if they're all in DCU environment and classrooms and lecture halls. So again, it begins to feel like university. In terms of our usage and feedback then, um, for the, the, the year gone past, um, we had just over 1,500 students engage with the courses and they completed between them over 5,000 discrete courses. And really what we've seen here is it's been a slow build, to be honest, you know, initially getting, getting going, um, it's so many things that are launched as students in first year. And we felt that, you know, it took us a while to kind of find our space there. But just in the last year, we've um, really seen a huge um, build in enthusiasm for the project, both among kind of students and staff. And um, so hence the, the jump in engagement between, say, this time last year and this time this year. Um, 2,000 students or 2,000 courses completed in May 19, gone up to 5,207 in May 20. So that just gives an idea of the, the interest in the courses. And, and we think that's probably due to rise as well in, in the years to come. Um, in particular in the current COVID situation. What's interesting about that also, when we looked at, again, we have the ability to, of course, track data and, and stats across faculties and, co and cohorts of students. Um, I didn't pull everything for the purpose of this presentation, but I did just have a look at the, the different faculties that we have within DCU. And what we see is that um, we, uh, 
significant overrepresentation of our distant students, so open education, um, as you can see here on the graph. That's essentially our students who are studying um, degrees um, at a distance. And um, they're basically extremely interested in this course. A lot of them complete not just one course, so don't just engage with one course, but actually complete all eight. Um, and I think that's, they're encouraged to do so by the lecturers, but I also think it provides a function for them to feel part of the DCU environment and community. And, um, you know, if, if they can't make the traditional student support workshop on X, Y, or Z, that normally happens at kind of lunchtime on a Tuesday, it's no issue because this resource is there for them 24 seven at a time that suits them to engage with. So um, I think that is also, I suppose, interesting in terms of what we're looking at all of us for the year ahead where you know, practically every student is becoming somewhat of a distant student. Um, and this type of um, facility, of course, may be particularly interesting uh, to them. So I'm, I'm gonna be interested to see what that brings um, over the months ahead. And then um, in terms of feedback- a, a two minute warning there, Killian. That's great, Rob. Yeah, just last slide actually, and a quick show of the, of the resource then take some questions. So in terms of feedback, um, we have this loop set up in every single course and we got hundreds of feedback comments um, from students on it. And the vast majority of students find the courses, you know, extremely useful. And the comments, um, again, overwhelmingly positive. Um, and what I try to do here is just pick out a couple that show how it speaks to hopefully different types of students. And I like the type of comment that, although I will now be starting my studies online, I now feel part of a community. That's really what we're trying to do with this resource, make few people feel part of DCU, even if they're not physically there. But it also speaks to secondary school students. I would highly recommend everyone to do this, as I'm sure it would make the transition from secondary school to DCU that little bit more easy. And then those type of comments, very helpful, love the videos and interviews with students. So the student voice is what people want to hear about this. Okay, so I'm um, open the floor to qu questions in a moment, but before I do so, I might just actually share my screen one final time with the course as it looks in um, the VLE, just for you guys to get a sense of that before I take some questions. I hope that's okay, Rob, your end. Um, yeah, of course, go ahead, Colleen. Yep. Great. So I'm just gonna stop this share and I'll do a new share screen with the course itself. So you guys can see what this looks like for the student when they come onto the course. So they just access it and there's an introduction to the course, a welcome from the Head of Students of Board Development, Dr. Claire Bowden, and then uh, just a video of how to actually use this course over the year ahead. We have it divided into two sections, stage one and stage two. And then basically all they all have to do is click on any of the labels and it takes them directly through to the, the course of their choice um, and that they can work through at their own pace. And then if they complete all eight courses, their certificate just appears at the very end of the screen here. And it's all automated with no admin work from us, which is what we like. So um, that's what the course looks and feels like. And I'd be uh, delighted now to take any questions or comments or, or uh, anything else that anybody would like to cover based on that presentation. Thanks. And it's over to oh, you. Great. So we use H5P, but not a bit like how they use it in DCU in a completely different way. So ours, we haven't even looked at um, sort of the H5P slides, which I think is brilliant. So I'm already excited about that, Killian, to use that for the autumn, like it'd be just phenomenal. So what we've done with H5P is really talk about interactions with students. So in terms of self-paced assessment, so at the end of a module, we give them a lot of quizzes and that's what we're using H5P for primarily in Merino. So just a brief bit about me, I, well, we just found out Rob and I didn't work together in the Law Society, but we were colleagues. So Rob and I have kept in contact over the years in terms of um, Moodle and what's going on in Moodle. And my own PhD was on uh, pre-service teachers' experiences with technology and ease of use. And one of the big findings that came out of it was that uh, pre-service teacher educators also needed technologies that were easy to use. So this is why we're looking at H5P now, certainly uh, for the autumn. Um, so I suppose for us, H5P um, is to make things simple for our lecturers to be able to interact with the students in an online environment. So uh, like um, in DCU, it's integrated in our Moodle, um, but we had to ask our Moodle provider to do that. They tend not to offer this information because um, we found they wanted us to go to them for lots of stuff. 
and it's biddable days. So now that the power is in our hands, I'm delighted we don't actually have to go to them for lots of stuff anymore because we can actually create this content ourselves. So ever the pragmatist and trying to save money in a small organization, um, it is about putting the control in the hands of the lecturer. So um, what it stands for is HTML5 package, in case you weren't aware, and it's HTML5 based. So it's uh, multi-platform, multi-device uh, compatible. And that's really, once the iPad came in, we had to move to that platform. And it's free. So that's when I see free, I'm always delighted. Um, so we've used it in across a lot of our online courses um, where we're not seeing our students. So in a purely online environment. So it's instant feedback for the students. And again, it's a method of them assessing their own learning on the module, whatever the module content is, so they know how they're doing. So I have three examples here. So we had a, a summer course actually. So we provide summer courses for teachers during the summer. They start on the 1st of July and they run all summer and teachers get um, days off if they do these courses. Um, and uh, we have four starting next Wednesday and I have two of them built, but hey, no pressure. Um, so in terms of interactions, the, the students on those courses want to know how they're getting on throughout the course. And because there's very little interaction with a lecturer or a facilitator, they don't know how they're doing unless they can check their own learning as they go. So if you look in the middle of the screen, and I'll actually drag, uh, drop out to it. Um, in Moodle, I built an interactive map um, so what I did was, um, I literally, this was a summer course um, about inclusive education um, and I got a map source from the web and then it, it was, it's a drag and drop. So we have to match the name of the um, African country to where it would be on a map. And then we can check our learning. So it's told me there that those four countries are not the right countries, for example. Um, and then, so I might retry that and it splits the text box back out and it lets me do the drag and drop activity again. Now, while it may look very simple, my biggest problem was I don't know the African landscape at all. So when my learning was actually which country was which, but once I found that out, the drag and drop, it's just, um, uh, it was just a case of building the interaction that it was a drag and drop. So if we actually look at the, um, the drag and drop activity at the back of that to see how it was built, if I go into that, I'll just scroll down. Can everyone see my screen still, yeah? Yeah, you're good, Alison. Okay, cool. So if I look at the back end of that H5P content, and let's expand it all. So as you can see, this H5P is embedded in Moodle. And I pulled in an image that's all I did. So it was just I, like grab the image off the internet, obviously copyright notwithstanding. And then the task was, I created these little dialogue boxes. And then when you drag them over and you tell them then, you give feedback on the position to where it has been dropped. So for example, uh, are you allowing retry? What happens if I drop it on that zone? All the sort of interactions that you would expect from a map. Um, and then in terms of feedback to the students, it tells them whether it's right or wrong. So there were lots of interactions in that course. I'll give you another example. Um, we use something called flip cards. So the flip card was um, asking them, posing questions to the participants. So for example, this is a Mercator map and we wanted them to identify three differences um, which relate to Africa between the two maps. So if I turn the flip card, I then let them know what the differences were in that map. So it was just, that was just again, an image with a text box underneath. So when the participant flipped, they were getting feedback as to what the map, the differences were. Um, and then the final one, which I got very excited about when I found it, was multiple choice questioning. So I presume you've all used multiple choice in Moodle and it's a bit clunky to build. So this is really easy to build. And actually in this case, the lecturer actually built this content themselves. So if I look at the settings behind this, so this quiz, it's telling them it's 20 questions 
and I used the uh, H5P quiz, which was the multiple choice quiz. And then I clicked on that, pulled it in, and then I started creating content. So again, I could add background image. Did I want people, did I need them to know how they're progressing along? What was the percentage pass rate? And then I started pulling in the multiple choice questions. So I actually typed these individually. So it was either a drag and drop multiple choice or a true false, so if it was multiple choice, I gave the question and then the first quest, uh, response was the correct answer. So you obviously have to tell us what the correct answer was. And then I gave other options and you could also feedback on them, you know, something like, oh no, that's the wrong uh, answer, for example. However, my screen, like to this day, I don't know how to get that screen to scroll across in H5P, but I did find out that by using the text button, you could actually just star the word beside it, instead of doing all that fancy picture stuff. So I found this then, I would actually drag in a Word document that the lecturer had sent me about the quiz. I'd ask them to mark the correct answer, and then I would just put a star beside the correct answer. So I'd say it, like, it reduced my time building a 20 item multiple choice to like minutes as opposed to hours. So being able to pull that text in was great and being able to edit stuff there. So if there was a typo or anything, I didn't have to go and try and find the question. I could just edit it in the text box. Um, so there are just three very simple ways of using it. And the students love it because it's immediate feedback and the lecturers love it because they can do it themselves. Um, so what I would suggest to you, and I, I can't tell from the screen, how many of you have Moodle and how many of you have this H5P plugin enabled. And if you haven't, just go to h5p.org and start playing with some of the content on it. So there's a very nice uh, flip card activity on the H5P homepage that tells you, um, you know, it just gives you a, 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 an immediate feedback, little trick and tool that you could use right now. And you could pull that into Moodle. And I suppose in terms of putting it into Moodle, how we do it, is it is literally just code to code. So if I go back into my Moodle instance, hold on, sorry, just sharing my screen again. Uh, if I go back into Moodle, I embed a lot of our content in the book editor on Moodle so that um, a participant will know where they're meant to be, what page they're meant to be on in their content, because they also like to download their content after for a summer course. So if I looked at any of the content in that uh, interaction, you can actually see it's embedded and on the right hand side that they're navigating around the rest of the content. So it is literally just the interaction happens at the end of the module. So it's not like I'm sending them off to another website, at least it's all contained on the same page for the end user. So in module two, that's more obvious. I'll just give you a look. Um, so all the content is there. And then this is where the drag and drop activity was embedded on the page within the HTML book editor. And H5P doesn't expect you to know the code. It provides you the embed code for you. So you literally just click on that code and drag and drop it into the HTML editor page on Moodle. Um, so what I would suggest to you, and um, I, some of you may have seen this presentation before, because I delivered it last year. And I suppose we've moved on from just assessment to now using the drag and drop facility to also uh, making sure that all our end users are enabled to use it. So our plan of action for the autumn, uh, given the COVID crisis, is that we are training Tell Me Champions. So TEL for Technology Enhanced Learning, MIE for Marino Institute of Education, so I'm going to train these tell me champions and they tell their um, colleagues in their departments how to do stuff. So it's tell me how to do it. That's the idea behind it. So uh, we have training sessions over the next two and a half weeks before people go on holidays to get people up to speed because the one to many approach will work in that obviously people in different departments have local requirements for H5P four other tools we're going to be training them on. But I think H5P, and given what I've seen with Killian, 
uh, I think we have huge potential to use this tool and to let students assess their own learning in a self-paced environment, which is the whole point of the online learning, which we're hoping to deliver for the autumn. Um, so just, I did a couple of screenshots there. I'm sure Rob will share them with you in terms of actually how to build an interaction in Moodle. But like, if you don't have the tool in Moodle, you do need to ask your Moodle provider to either create it for you or um, get them to pull the plugin into your Moodle instance. But once it's there, you're literally just adding it as an adding interactive content. But as we've seen in the earlier presentation, if it's going to be core in Moodle 8 or Moodle 9, uh, 3.9, like it'll be right there. You won't even need to ask for it. So that's kind of good news for everybody. That's it. I'll stop sharing my screen.